Uh, thanks very much for coming. Um, uh, my name is Blaine Lewis. Uh, I'm the head of the Indonesia Project. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our final um, speaker today, um, Dr. Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who, of course, I guess everybody knows is the current Minister of Finance. Um, I'll just give a few uh, words of introduction about uh, Ibu while we're all getting settled here. Um, uh, Buani has her PhD in economics uh, from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, um, after which she uh, went to the University of Indonesia as a faculty member, um, LPAM. And um, <clears throat> uh, after that, she served as executive director uh, of the IMF from 2002 to 2004, um, at which time she became head of Bapanas for a little bit over a year, I think. Is that right, Bull? A little bit over a year. Uh, and then she became the Minister of Finance in 2005 until 2010. And after that, she served uh, as Managing Director uh, of the World Bank um, for a number of years. And then she returned uh, to Indonesia in 2016 to take up uh, uh, the, uh, the post of the Minister of Finance again uh, for the second time. So Ibu's had a very varied career uh, in academia um, at the University of Indonesia, also served for a brief stint at uh, Georgia State University as a visiting fellow. Uh, she's uh, had uh, high-level positions in uh, major international financial institutions, uh, the IMF and the World Bank, and of course uh, has served uh, in the capacity as uh, minister both in Bapanas and the minister, uh, Ministry of Finance. So we're very pleased to have um, uh, Buani here uh, to speak uh, uh, with us today. Um, so, Buani, over to you. Thank you, Blaine. Thank you. Um, very good afternoon to all of you. It's good to be back here again and uh, always meet with uh, familiar faces, all my friends. Uh, Thank you also for inviting me to speak on this uh, Indonesia update uh, for tw uh, 2022. After two and a half years, we are in pandemic, and it's good to be back and meet people uh, in person. Although some of you are still wearing masks, some not. So <laughs> this is just to show that we are in a transition. So uh, the same thing also in Indonesia. I was invited to talk about th uh, three very important topic which is also dear to my heart. First is the human capital, gender equality, and fiscal policy. I understand that the Indonesia update this year focusing more on uh, gender equality as well as diversity, which is also uh, very close to uh, my own heart and priority uh, leading the Minister of Finance. Uh, let me uh, present you starting with uh, where we are at this moment and what is the aspiration of Indonesia. I don't have to speak this slide. I think all of you here in this room knows Indonesia very well as the largest economy in Southeast Asia uh, in which we are having rising middle class, almost 20% uh, of our population now in the middle class and aspiring middle class, close to uh, more than 48%. We are becoming uh, the largest economy not only in Southeast Asia but also in the world joining the G20, of course, since uh, 1999, uh, after the ASEAN financial crisis, and also uh, with a relatively st stable high economic growth, uh, Indonesia is catching up uh, with many, uh, not only among emerging country, but also uh, aspire to become high income country. As outlined by our RPGM, that is the long-term national group, Goal: Indonesia is aiming for the high-income countries uh, in 2045 when we, inshallah, uh, celebrated 100 years of the Indonesia independence. Avoiding middle-income uh, traps is now becoming the language which is spoken by all politicians, which is good uh, because I make this as a very popular term for Indonesia after I return back from the World Bank. Uh, seeing that not many country in the world can actually escape middle income trap easily. Certainly, in order for us to be able to aspire for the high income countries, we have to make sure that the human capital is going to be 
uh, also important or this is become the necessary condition to become a high income country in addition to of course institutional building and sustainable economic development. In the year of 2045, we are uh, projecting that more than 70% of the population live in urban area. The female or labor participation is going to reach 65%. And of course, we are aiming for a zero poverty rate by that time. Uh, the very critical uh, area or key that need to be prepared for those is the uh, human capital development which is related to the three area of development, education, health, and social protection or uh, social safety net. <clears throat> On a health issue, of course, because we are very much dominated by the pandemic in the, uh, in the past two and a half years, so it is shifted in terms of the pandemic preparedness and ability to deal with the uh, pandemic. Indonesia is not bad at all, actually, given the size, the complexity, as well as the per capita income, actually we are dealing with the pandemic relatively well. Uh, but we know that this is still need a lot of uh, work to be done on improving our health system, especially uh, emphasizing more on a preventive and promotive uh, uh, strengthening health system. Also encouraging more health sector industries in Indonesia. The recognition, uh, especially during this pandemic, when we suddenly have to build many of the health facility up to the primary, to the referral hospital. Also in this case, uh, the ability to continue develop, uh, including the vaccine is becoming one of the most important priority of the government uh, now. On the education side, uh, Indonesia has been through many reform and I'm going to uh, provide you with uh, where we are on the timeline. And also social, social protection, making sure that when we are uh, making this journey toward high income uh, economy, that the inequality is not widened and especially also not no one uh, left behind. So let me talk about the human capital, especially on the health sector first. Starting with maybe 1960, uh, no Blaine at that time is still very, very young. <laughs> and today you are still young. <laughs> Indonesia has introduced family planning program. To be very honest, when I work in the World Bank and I travel to Africa, there are many countries is actually asking many European countries asking how Indonesia was able to be successfully introduced this family program. Because it's actually one of the very key for Indonesia to be able to improve the prosperity of the family and also uh, the consequence in terms of the ability to empower women through this program is actually very, very strong. We established the BKKBN, that, that is the National uh, Family Planning Coordinating Board in 1970s. And today, we are also revitalizing this uh, family program, fam family planning program, with the attention mainly for the improvement of the welfare, especially on the immunization and stunting. This is the two very important that we are now looking uh, as the health issue, especially related to the younger generation in Indonesia. In 1980, we also established the primary health care that is post and Puskesmas. This is one of using the oil revenue back then, avoiding Dutch disease, investing money for the health and education by our senior technocrat, uh, Pak Wijoyo, Pak Ali Wardana. And uh, in 2009, we completed the immunization program for children. And since 2016, we allocated 5% of our budget for the health spending. Healthcare for especially the poor has been introduced in early 2000. And now it's been established uh, in the form of uh, JKN, that is uh, Jaminan Kesehatan Nasional that is to provide access of health and insurance, especially for, for the poor. 
So basically do very important milestone on the health area. We just also intended, unintended, uh, directly or indirectly is going to also affect the well-being of women in Indonesia. Family planning program and national health insurance. The family planning program empowering women and improving women health uh, as well as enhancing the welfare of family, especially poor family, and increasing the quality of human resources. Through to this family program over the time, the Indonesia has been able to reduce the population growth from 2.7% to 1.1%. This is one of the most successful, and that's why when I said when I was in the World Bank and traveling in some African country, which is currently still facing with a very high population growth, and it's very challenging for them to be able to continue addressing the issue of poverty. On the national health insurance, uh, which is uh, introduced through our legislation, the idea is to try to prevent uh, family to become poor when part of the member of the family, family becoming sick. So reducing the out-of-pocket uh, health expenditure and increasing utilization, also increasing health facility becoming very, very important. We are still uh, in a very early state of this national health insurance scheme. We also have a hiccup, for example, like in 2017-19, when the health bill of this national insurance uh, system cannot be afforded, so we have to inject through government budget uh, through this uh, scheme. This is one of the areas which we need to continue build in which we are going to be able to first provide in access of the health for the people, especially for women and children. And the second one is how this can be provided in a sustainable way. That is also the whole ecosystem of the health need uh, to be continued, improved and strengthened. Currently, 86.5% of our population enroll in this GKN. It's supposed to be the universal health coverage. That means it's supposed to be 100%. So the, we are still have a private system, but this is one of the area in which Indonesia is still in the middle of really designing what is the right national health system in Indonesia, including the insurance. On the education uh, side, on a very important human capital investment, Indonesia has been evolved just like in health in 1970 and 80s, when Indonesia enjoyed the oil boom at that time, we invested many of them in the education, starting with the compulsory education six year, started introduced in 1970. And then it's lengthened into nine years compulsory education, and then currently now in 12, we are think thinking of even expanded into 13 years. Of course, the compulsory education is not just lengthening the mandatory compulsory uh, education for especially population uh, for the uh, uh, children, but immediately we can identify that the need to build all the facility of the education. It is not in the form of the school class, uh, but also most importantly is the teachers and the quality of the teachers. And this is the area that we are still continue struggling, despite since 2009, when I was finance minister back then, that was when Indonesia starting to introduce 20% of our budget spending should be for education. So I was finance minister in 2008, in which we were sued in the constitutional court that if we are not complying with this constitutional mandatory education spending, government can be impeached. So suddenly I have to shift all the spending into education. A lot of money doesn't mean that you have a lot of idea to use it wisely. And that's why at that time, and sometime the budget system in Indonesia, we are introducing the midterm revision of the budget in which we realize that this is not going to be 20%. So in the, the fiscal year in Indonesia is January to December. 
by August when we discuss with the parliament that it is not going to be achieved 20%, we suddenly have to increase spending by trillion of money. And because we are applying single budget years, then the Minister of Education is just spending it for everything. Some school is actually have the tile will be replaced because they have to spend the money. They buy whatever they like in this case. And that is exactly the terrifying of what you call it good intention without a really good and well-designed policy. So that's why in 2010, I start to establish what you call it endowment fund for the education. Rather than you just allocated the money and spend it without appropriate preparation, this money, which is supposed to be 20% of our budget, then put it in this endowment fund. The idea was introduced in 2010, and then I resigned and then started establishing what we call it agency, which is very well known, LPDP. This is the education uh, uh, endowment fund. We start with one trillion at that time, and of course I was thinking that with this funding, uh, I will be able to send many Indonesia bright to the best university in the world. I'm so obsessed with that actually. <laughs> Because when I was finance minister, uh, all my colleague finance minister, even in uh, ASEAN, not to mention G20, they are all have the stuff which is keren in Indonesia. We call it keren because they are smart, keren, and pinter. Uh, so I was thinking that my staff should be also keren, smart, and pinter. <laughs> and that's why we spent many of that. So that was the uh, the starting of the LPDP with 1 trillion and now we have 120 trillion uh, on the endowment fund. Uh, we also, the school expansion policy definitely have a huge implication. A lot of reform within the education has been introduced currently under Nadim, of course, the introduced Merdeka Belajar and Campus Merdeka. And we also use fiscal tools more, more actively and more innovative in this case, including encouraging private sector so that they are going to have link and match. And link and match is actually introduced since I was student also at that time. But today we are using the private sector in order for them to be able to develop the vocational training and allowing their company to accept many student, which is not yet graduated, to second in their uh, company and all the spending that they are located for those activity can be super deducted for the tax purposes. We also introduced super deduction for the research and innovation, not only uh, for the public, but also private sector. So these are all the evolution of using the fiscal tools. It's not only just allocation of the budget for education spending through ministries or local government, because education is one of the function which is delegated to the local government, but most importantly, also involving more private sector so that the link and match between the education system and what is the labor uh, market is going to be much closer. We also, in this case, uh, have the reform on what we call it the fund transfer directly to the school. So before this, the fund, because as I said, education is delegated to the local government. So if government budget, central government, spend for the education to support primary, secondary, and high school, which is all delegated to the local level, we spend it through the local budget. Local government budget not necessarily then executing timely, and not to mention sometimes there is a governance problem in which the school, in order to get the money, they then have the high cost, high transaction cost. I don't want to use the word corruption, but yeah, it's there. <laughs> so uh, then uh, when Nadim became the uh, education uh, minister, we discussed about how we are going to be able to reform this transfer system. With the digital technology, it's actually much easier. We now know the school, the school account number, and where they are, so that we are going to be able to directly transfer 
from central government to the school account number. This is one of uh, the system that we introduced in 2009, uh, and also at the same time trying to improve in terms of the ability to spend those biaya operasi sekolah or BOS, which is actually computed based on how number pupil in each of the school. So this is a very uh, reform in terms of how we use the money of this 20% mandated by con constitution. Very good intention, but not necessarily easily to manage, and especially when immediately you have to spend 20% of your budget for the education. We still actually now discussing regarding how to reform the education so that we are going to better use of this 20% of our allocation of budget for the education. And as, as I said earlier, that endowment fund, which is introduced in 2010 and then LPDP established in 2011, started with one trillion. Until 2016, it's actually only 1.5, uh, be, uh, becoming 15 trillion. So we are now achieving 7.1 billion US dollar, if you can, this is in a billion US dollar, not in trillion rupiah, uh, because it's easy for you to imagine billion rather than trillion rupiah in this case. So I translate it to you all. And with this funding, we were able to now uh, send 32,842 32, scholarship, uh, which is awarded for both domestic as well as the uh, foreign, uh, and with this good news, 52% more is actually those who receive it receive this award scholarship are women. So it's more than 50%. I don't know whether this is the quality of women or the quality of men, <laughs> but it is 52.4 <laughs> women receive this one. And we also funded more than 1,600 research projects, and many of these research projects have been conducted jointly with the international known. So this is all becoming one of the area in which now many, many, many uh, people have uh, the hope. And I really enjoy many stories of those students who initially they don't have any hope. They have the dream but not hope that I can pursue education in, in the best university. One very favorite story is uh, the daughter of Tukang Beca di Semarang, because this is the student of my late parent, this daughter from Tukang Beca. She was among the brightest student graduated, and then she now pursuing, or she's now completed the PhD program in UK. So this is one of the very, very powerful tools in Indonesia in which we continue uh, providing this opportunity for the Indonesia best and uh, the brightest to be able to continue that program. I do understand this is not going to solve all the Indonesia problem, but it definitely create more confidence, especially among uh, the younger generation in Indonesia that they have many facility provided by the government, the state. So the state presence and they can actually pursue their ambition. As I said earlier also that we use fiscal in a more innovative way to support the education uh, reform, including introducing super deduction or super tax deduction for both uh, education, training, vocational, as well as research. On a social protection, this is the a third dimension of the human capital and also including women empowerment. We actually introduce not in the form of the social protection or social safety net as we know today. Back then, it was introduced more as a poverty alleviation program. For example, like the massive agriculture credit or BIMAS, BIMAS in mass. Uh, which is introduced by, again, the old technocrat, our senior technocrat before, using the oil revenue to improve uh, the agriculture product productivity. And at that time, was introduced back in 1969, 
which is lasted. Then in 90, early 1990, we also recognized that many villages in Indonesia are still left behind, or in this case, disadvantaged. And that's why there is a presidential instruction in press, which is uh, mandating for us to be able to catch up inequality need to be avoided. So we have the impress desa tertinggal, that is EDT. That's in the 1990s. Uh, the current policy related to village is actually we introduced since 2015 now within the fiscal tool, a village fund within government transfer. So again, just like the transfer directly to the school, we also have a transfer directly to the village so we know 74,000 more villages in Indonesia by location, by account number. So we directly transfer to this village uh, fund. More than 480 trillion or 31.4 billion US dollar since 2015 has been transferred directly to villages. This also explains why the Gini coefficient in Indonesia is improving. And that is also uh, the area that we are looking for. The social safety net, which is designed more in a, what you call it, legal and mandatory and systemic way, was introduced in 2004 with the passing of the legislation of national so social security system. And then we established one unified database of the poor people in Indonesia which is now being managed. We also have the Family Hope Program, which targeting poor family by name, by address, and by their profile of the family. These are all uh, becoming the reform of the poverty alleviation. The government under President Jokowi now aiming for the absolute poverty that need to be reduced in a significant way, close to zero by 2024, according to the uh, World Bank uh, measurement of the absolute poverty. So we are now targeting directly to the village level, which uh, village which is still left behind, which family that need to be targeted. Family Hope Program or Program Keluarga Harapan, which is now targeting 10 million family. This is a conditional cash transfer, which is providing cash directly to the family, but with the conditional that they need to send their children to school. They have to send their children to get the immunization. So that's why the design of this family program is actually comprises of three areas, health component, education component, and social welfare component. On a health, this is related to, again, women, uh, that is pregnant woman, family with the pregnant woman, or early childhood, children at the early childhood age, they will get a certain sum of money to get the support so that uh, those uh, pregnant women will get uh, a good quality of nutrition. On the education component, each family which have depend on their family member, if they have primary, junior, and senior high school, then they are going to receive a different amount of cash transfer, which is linked to the needs of their education. And then on the social welfare component, if the family members, some, uh, they have severe dis disability or elderly, then they are also provided by additional uh, cash for them. So these are all the design for us to be able to cut the poverty intergenerational. The poor family should not, their children becoming also automatically poor because they cannot get the initial immunization and health services, as well as the ability for them to be able to sustain uh, their family uh, livelihood in a, a proper and decent way. In addition to this cash transfer, the government also providing the economic empowerment through many of what we call it access to finance. From the very, very small one, we call it ultra micro, UMI. This is uh, aiming for especially women. 95% of women uh, of the 5.38 million uh, now receiving this ultra micro credit. 
we also providing the membina ekonomi keluarga sejahtera it is popular by the mekar is actually also targeting for the family which uh, also mostly women who then they have the economic activity and uh, currently 11.1 million of women enroll in this makar so you can imagine that this is like on a family side we attack through this family hope program and economic empowerment through this umi and makar this is not to uh, include the credit usaha rakyat which is channeling through the banking system from the fiscal point of view Uh, in addition to the this direct spending which is empowering human capital and especially also women we also provide through the taxation small medium enterprises in indonesia have the final tax which is very low only 0.5% of their gross sales we also providing empowerment to the training as well as other program so with this spending on education health as well as social spending which is actually increased uh, quite significantly in the past uh, 15 years we can see that uh, the spending on this human capital is become the majority of our spending in our budget uh, education increased by 237% between 2007 to 2021 health of course this is distorted by the pandemic in the past two years but also increased very dramatically to 1306 percent and also social uh, spending or assistance increased by 224 percent the domination of our spending is actually on human capital and that's why when we are talking about the subsidy in the fuel and others which is now also becoming increased because of the price of the oil uh, globally that's become a tension with our allocation for human capital because it is directly uh, con- contested with this uh, uh, allocation of spending with those increase uh, spending we also see the result so if you look at the life expectancy in indonesia has been improved from 65 years to 71.8 years and the infant mortality dropped very rapidly from 41% to 19.5 still high but it's actually uh, dropped uh, quite uh, significantly we also see the illiteracy rate has been dropped to only 3.63% and the years of schooling also expanded from only 6.7 years to 8.97 If you look at the mandatory schools, uh, which is now 12, it is still way below that one. But this is uh, the direction that we would like to continue improve. And uh, of course, poverty rate has been declined, although a little bit pick up because of the pandemic into double digit. But currently, we see the 9.51 percent decline and continue aiming for below 8 percent by hopefully next year. Gini ratio, as I mentioned, uh, after pick up very uh, uh, strongly in the early 2000, now at the level of 0.38. We also see from the indicator of the gender equality the improvement. If you look at the woman enrollment rate in the secondary school, they improve very significantly from 81 percent to 90 percent. and women oh, of course this is on the politics side in which you've already discussed when and a half day so i'm not going to touch on this issue i'm sure you have a lot of, uh, to discuss maybe i can get uh, the summary and recommendation and uh, professional workforce women also improved from 45% to 50 with all this progress certainly we are not complacent still a lot of homework need to be done for indonesia with our population which is 11 time of australia so you can imagine that i have 11 time headache than <laughs> jim chalmers here uh, and certainly we have to really think uh, how we are going to make better use of the limited and scarce resources so that it will have a better result 
Stunting is one of the priority of the government now. So we are empowering not only the Puskesmas Posyandu, but we are now introducing BKKBN because they know the family, they know the bidan, and they are now aiming not only just family planning, which is already very successful in the past four decades. Now it should be in the form of improvement of uh, the, 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 the children uh, nutrition so that they are avoided from uh, the stunting. PISA score Indonesia has been known as uh, lowest in ASEAN. So this is despite the 20% of spending of our budget. So the discussion regarding learning process, curriculum, and of course, teacher quality is becoming very, very important. We are discussing about this because at the same time, when I was in the World Bank, the issue of this stunting has been uh, introduced by President Kim at that time. I was the managing director for the operation and said, Sri Mulyani, you were very successful in managing fiscal, but your stunting level in Indonesia is so embarrassing. So I'm embarrassed. And I tried to make this embarrassment contagious in Indonesia again. And now it's becoming the priority, which is good. Uh, we want to make sure that this is not necessarily always a poor family. Sometimes it's that the poor information and the ability to use uh, the family own resources in order to directly or smartly choosing the right nutrition for their children. So a lot of education really needed. And of course, the female labor force participation in Indonesia still below 55% way be below the Australian, which is now 61%, and we need to empower more. On the gender, with the gender development index uh, relatively s flat uh, over the time, but we also see there is a gender empowerment index, which is improved. If you look at the right side, the gender issue, on the education and health, the access and the equality based on gender is relatively well achieved on the education access and health facility. But on the two very important, that is economy and politics, women is still lag behind severely for Indonesia. On the economic side, this has something to do with sometimes it's not because of the education, but it's because of many women, once they get married, they then have to choose between family or work. It's actually the same faced by all women in the world. So the question is how Indonesia will be able to provide this trade of less for the women in Indonesia so that they are going to be able to pursue their economic opportunity. Digital technology now providing a huge actually opportunity for the woman to continue still managing the family and at the same time also pursuing their economic uh, opportunity. I think this is one of the area which we look at the financial inclusion, credit, uh, access to credit for women, but also with uh, now digital technology platform, which allowing them to become uh, also the economic uh, agent or uh, players without leaving their house. Pandemic is now creating also a different kind of thing because people for two years is live in their house and they can still also continue doing their uh, productive uh, activity. In politics, which is much less in this case, 0 0.164, we have Indonesia president woman once, we have the head, the speaker of the parliament, a woman. We have finance minister, woman. We have foreign minister, woman. So we have portfolio which is traditionally perceived as a man portfolio. It is actually a glass ceiling has been broken, but it's become just an outlier. It's not become a norm. So the question for Indonesia is not that whether Indonesia have, because if I talked to Janet Yellen, United States takes more than 200 years to have the first woman finance minister, right? Indonesia, 70 years less we actually have. So we are actually much, much faster. We have, 
we have a woman president in the United States until now is just aiming for that, but not yet. So, I mean, but the problem is not just one example case, but how you are going to be able to provide a more chance opportunity so that it's become a norm rather than the exception. So if it is only the exception, then it's not going to really breaking the glass and then allowing others, women, to be able to continue uh, moving uh, up to that opportunity. So it is becoming one of the issue. There is a mandatory 30% on the parliamentary uh, member uh, sup supposed to be women. Uh, DPD is much better, but DPR is a little bit less than that. We also have, of course, the, the perception regarding the woman as a leader, which is not yet favorable. It's become a debate also. I don't know uh, whether you are discussing in the past two days here, but this is one of the examples of one of the issues in which so many aspects and factors has actually influenced. If you look at the evidence, it is obvious that if women have more participation in the economy, it is not only good for that woman, for the family, but also for the country. So the study by McKinsey is telling that globally, we are going to get 13 trillion US dollar more economic globally if women have a better participation. For Indonesia, 135 billion US dollar or 9% increase of our GDP if women can actually participate more fully in the economy. Whether this is through the labor participation, which I mentioned earlier, is still below 55%. Whether this is from the our works contributed and from their productivity, which is going to also improve. And that's have a real economic benefit for the economy, but also for their family, as well as for those women in terms of their confidence and dignity. So for this area, we, need, we really need, uh, need to look. Women income contribution in Indonesia is still 37%. This is almost half than men. The income per capita expenditure of women is only 9 million, comparing to 15.8 million of men. For the health condition, which is relatively, in this case, number of health complaints of women uh, higher than men, they usually work juggling. If men going to their house, they deserve to get rest. If women work outside and going back, they deserve to work again. So uh, this is creating the asymmetric and the maternal mortality in Indonesia is still uh, actually need to be improved. So as I said earlier, the participation of women in a DPD is much higher than DPR, but uh, this is one of the area which is not only just mandatory 30%, but how you are going to achieve and not become just mandatory again because you want to comply with the quota, but really providing participation of women. But all this story about human capital and gender equality and empowerment in Indonesia can only be done when the economy is continue stable and growing. And when the macroeconomic tools, including fiscal, providing with this very obvious uh, priority in their fiscal if you look at the Indonesia, the growth of the Indonesia economy is relatively above the emerging market. With the relatively also stable, that is the inflation also relatively lower than our emerging peers. Of course, you can pick some country which is higher than Indonesia or lower than Indonesia. But if you look at across time and also across emerging country, Indonesia is actually doing relatively well meaning that Indonesia have the opportunity to catch up. This is what you call it, the aspiration or the goals toward a high income economy is actually have the track record. And we are doing this while continue maintaining a prudent macro policy that is fiscal and monetary side. So we are not using it like uh, hit and run, 
using the visca in an irresponsible way in order to catch up our maybe uh, development indicators. But then we are entering the fiscal crisis. So Indonesia, relatively in this case, have the macro policy, both on the fiscal and the monetary. And if you look at the fiscal situation today, Indonesia is relatively in a very health situation. Indonesia, amazingly, with this kind of situation, the debate regarding the debt in Indonesia is becoming very political. So the perception as if that we are entering a debt crisis is quite, uh, for some population, is still there. So this is one of the area which is uh, actually for the finance minister is also good because if people so uh, uh, fear of debt, that's also make us becoming even more prudent. I can imagine if uh, people in Indonesia love to get debt, then they are going to just ask everything for free. And then they don't want to pay tax, just borrowing and borrowing, borrowing. And so uh, within the Indonesia public debate, it is actually good to say that, OK, you don't like debt, then pay tax. If you don't like tax and debt, then we are not going to do anything. So these are all the policy choices which we as a finance minister try to continue communicating regarding the choice of policy. But for sure, if you want to achieve more goals in the development, you need resources. If you want to, call, if you want to have more goals, and then of course governance is important, but also resources is very important. And that's also reflected in our response to this pandemic. In the past three years, it's been uh, exceptional and extraordinary for all of us. Despite that, Indonesia is actually managing relatively well on the pandemic uh, response. Fiscal is becoming one of the most important. And in 2023, if you look at Indonesia, only three years, we are now consolidating our fiscals. During the pandemic, we were forced to abandon the prudent fiscal rule, allowing the deficit above six percent, uh, above three percent, and we end up with the six point one percent of GDP in 2020. When the revenue dropped because of the pandemic, no activity, while the spending increased to address the issue of health, then we have this widening deficit. Next slide, and then in 2020. One, recovery of the economy starting, and we are able to consolidate the fiscal. At that time, we actually introduced what you call it emergency law in order for us to allow for three years emergency to respond to this extraordinary challenge of a pandemic with widening deficit. But we are aiming for the deficit below 3% by next year. And we are now discussing with the parliament in fact, uh, this week, actually, I'm still in the parliament, so uh, I can skip a little bit two days with the exceptional permit from the parliament because I'm attending this very important meeting. So you should be thankful for the parliament. Uh, because, you know, finance minister usually is always like, if you are in a budget session, you, you cannot go anywhere. You're just there until your budget is being approved. So. Uh, with a good excuse uh, of coming here, uh, I can come and at least have a little bit uh, the feeling of uh, early springtime here. Uh, so uh, the Indonesia fiscal policy continued to be very uh, transparent, prudent, of course, and this is one of the most important uh, policy to support uh, the development goal, especially on the human capital and also gender empowerment. Again, in the past three years and now continue until 2024, we are going to continue putting human capital as uh, the highest priority within our budget uh, design. In addition to the infrastructure, which is mainly also improving many of the welfare and also the reform in the economy as well as bureaucracy. So for uh, 2022, and 2023, we will continue deepening our reform. Many of the reform is not like a fanfare reform in which you can celebrate it. It's silent, but it's so important. Building the right foundation for education, for health, 
for social safety net, this is something which is cannot be easily appreciated because the result usually takes time. It's not like building the tall road in which people will see, oh, now the tall road is there in front of my house, in which then they can see it. Building human capital takes medium long-term time, and there is no really celebration, like you can cut the ribbon, now the student suddenly the PISA score 100, that's not going to happen. So these are all the commitment which is really require a continuous, uh, what you call it, uh, policy, priority that need to be consistent over time because it cannot be like on and off also. If you do that, then it will not achieve the, the right result. So these are all my presentation. I do hope that providing you at least the complete uh, description and as well as the program that we are having. And I do hope this is also complement into your today's discussion on the Indonesia update. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Ibu Ani. Uh, Ibu has been a, a longtime supporter of the Indonesia Project across her various positions in academia and, and government and uh, international financial institutions. So we thank you very much for that. Much appreciated. Um, if you'll please bear with me uh, just a little while longer, I have a bunch of more thanks to get through. So um, don't leave yet. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the in-person audience. It's great to be back face-to-face uh, -face after two years strictly online, so it's good to see you all face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, nevertheless, we've still maintained a, quite a strong online presence uh, with over 700 people, 750 who have registered online, so I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Anybody left here from DFAT? Ah, there you go. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, our home here is uh, the Australian National University, uh, in particular the College of Asia and the Pacific, uh, CAP. Um, spe special thanks to Helen Sullivan, uh, our dean, and the Art Corden Department of Economics inside the Crawford School of Public Policy, uh, the Department of Political and Social Change inside Coral Bell. We've got some Marcus here, and Ed and Greg are still around, Sally, uh, um, among others. Thanks very much for that. Uh, along with the Indonesia Institute, uh, and of course the Indonesia Embassy, Padubus um, Masiada, uh, A particular thanks for our, our conveners, who uh, Angie and Sarah and uh, Ruri. Thanks very much. Um, thanks uh, much for putting together such a fascinating program. Uh, very well executed. Uh, one of the best in recent memory. Um, as you might imagine, it's quite, uh, it's, it requires quite a bit of effort to put together the, the Indonesia update uh, every year. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the following for their heroic efforts in, uh, in putting the whole thing together. And if you're here in the, uh, in the, in the room, you could still, if you could stand up so we could acknowledge, it, acknowledge you. Kate, is Kate around? <laughs> Um, Lydia? Okay, uh, and Sita and Alex, our newest members of the Indonesia Project. Thank you very much. Um, additional support uh, on the past couple of days, Lolita, Noor, uh, Siauki, uh, and Indra. I hope I didn't miss anybody. If you're here, please raise your hands. Um, thank you. Um, the, uh, the proceedings for the conference will be published in a, in a book as usual, so our convener's job is not quite done yet. Uh, over the next couple of months, they'll be putting together the, uh, the academic chapters uh, on which the presentations were, were based, uh, so sometime early next year. I'm going to hold you to early next year. Um, the, the book will be published, um, uh, so we're looking forward to that. Um, for those of you who have pre-ordered, uh, there will be a lunch. Uh, it looks like the weather has turned a little bit chilly, so the lunch will be indoors. As you're leaving, um, uh, there'll be some people out there to, oh, uh, Indra is going to uh, point people in the right direction. Thank you for that, Indra. So if you're here for lunch, uh, Indra will, will show you where to go. Um, it looks to be just about it. We have one final uh, bit of business. Um, we're in the early stages of planning next year's Indonesia update. 
Um, and Ed Aspinall and colleagues will be um, the conveners for that uh, update. And Ed is going to give a brief rundown on what the, at, what the next year's update is going to be like. So, Ed, thanks. Thank you, Blaine. So the theme of next year's Indonesia update will be Governing Urban Indonesia. Um, I'll be convening it along with Dr. Amalinda Savirani from Universitas Kajamada. Um, as you would know, uh, Indonesia is now a majority of a majority urban country with almost 60% of the population living in urban areas. And with the proliferation of the urban population, we see the rise of all those normal uh, problems associated with urbanism, garbage management, pollution, traffic congestion, uh, having just come back from Jakarta, I can confirm it's still a problem, um, <laughs> public transportation, flooding, and so on. So we'll be looking at some of those issues, also looking at some of the issues around urban design and planning, uh, the rise of gated communities, apartment living, what this means for urban government, the role of like real estate companies and, and developers uh, in urban government. Um, and then also look at the sort of the patterns of urban governance that are emerging across the country. There's a real range uh, from uh, 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 cities such as Surabaya, which have been seen as sort of uh, really pione pioneering uh, political reform, governance reform, better delivery of um, government services, um, cleaning up the city uh, very visibly, but also cities like Medan, where we've seen three mayors arrested and, and put in prison for corruption uh, in the Reformasi period, and which uh, a city which is sometimes known as Kota Seribu Lubang, um, uh, or City of a Thousand Potholes, although I believe that's also, ch uh, uh, also changing. So they're the sort of issues uh, that we'll be looking at at next year's Indonesia update. And I want to also draw your attention, just use this opportunity to draw your attention to another, another event we have in a couple of weeks, which is the inaugural Tony and Johanny Johns lecture. This is the first of what will be an annual uh, lecture uh, series uh, made uh, in honor of these very uh, prominent founding members of Indonesian studies community here at the ANU and made possible uh, by a generous donation by Tony and Helen, Helen Reed. This will be on thir Thursday, the 29th of September. Uh, Emeritus Professor uh, Greg Feely will be speaking on the topic of restoring religious and cultural complexity to the study of Southeast Asian Islam. So please Google that, uh, come along, and uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you, Blaine. <laughs> Okay, so we're done. Uh, <laughs> those of you who want to have lunch, please uh, exit and take a sharp left, I think. Indra will be out there. Thank you very much. <laughs>